Hi guys, it's X. Welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we are going to be talking about the differences between palliative care, hospice care, and comfort care. Mind you, I've only worked in California. I don't know if other states or other regions in California consider this something different. So this is just my experiences with it. I'm just going to explain what the differences are because I feel like a lot of people misinterpret what it is and I would like if the general community learned a little bit more about this stuff so that they knew how to make decisions for themselves at home. I'm also going to link down um, advanced directives video after this video so that you guys can understand what an advanced directive is, what a pulse is, and stuff like that because even if you're young, I think it's very important for you to have one of those just so that if anything does happen to you because you never know when life is going to change in a split second, um, you at least know what that is and know what you would like for yourself and the decisions you want to make. So before you swipe me away or click me on this video, please like, comment, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you. Okay, so let's start off with palliative care. I think people hear the term palliative care and they think automatically like, oh, they're giving up on me and they just think I'm going to die. And that is simply not true. I feel like that is the first thing that goes through everyone's mind when we get palliative care on board. So what palliative care actually is, is for people who have a chronic illness, doesn't matter exactly how much time you have to live. It is just that you have a chronic illness and they focus on optimizing your quality of life. They want you to be comfortable. They want you to, you know, live life as great as you can, as best as you can, and pain-free. So I think palliative care, because they end up doing um, the end-of-life care and they do um, comfort care in the hospital, I think when you hear palliative, it is automatically a negative thing that goes through people's minds. And I don't want that to continue to be a stigma of being a negative thing. It is not a negative thing. They are focusing on symptom management and making sure that you are having the best quality of life that you could have with your chronic illness. Um, I believe they also deal with like spiritual care. It's like a multidisciplinary team that works with you, whether it be social workers, case management, and all this stuff to make you have the best life that you can possibly have and manage your disease the best that you can which leads me into hospice. So a lot of places that do have uh, palliative care teams do run hospice. So I think that's where people kind of get confused to what that is. Um, so with hospice, hospice, you do have a definitive less than six months to live and they focus on symptom management. They focus on end of life care. And I don't know if you watched my videos before, but when I was a nursing student, I did a rotation with a home health nurse who was specifically a hospice nurse. And you guys, it took every bone in my body to sit there and not walk out or run out or cause a fit because I didn't want my nursing school to look bad. But I didn't know exactly, like, I knew what hospice care was by definition, but I didn't understand it fully. So, the first time that I went with hospice um, care to do home health, um, we went to see a couple of patients, but one of them happened to be actively dying and all they were doing was giving Ativan and morphine. And I saw this patient literally gasping for air and it bothered me so badly to just sit there and watch because I was like, I'm a nurse. I'm trained to save lives, not trained to watch people die and not do anything about it. But of course, at that point, I wasn't, I was in like not even a new grad. I was still in nursing school. I was in my fourth semester. And to me, I didn't understand what that meant. It wasn't until my first job where I started working with people who had no quality of life, who had been that way for many, many years that I actually became an advocate for palliative care, home uh, health, and I'm sorry, not home health, uh, hospice care and comfort care. And that was because I always thought save lives save lives we have to make sure people are living but i didn't understand that just because you have a heartbeat doesn't mean you're alive like just like the Nicki minaj song like everybody dies when everybody lives like it makes sense to me now because just because you have a heartbeat 
doesn't mean you have quality of life. Just because you are breathing and your eyes open and maybe you can move a little bit doesn't mean that you have a great quality of life. And for somebody to be kept this way without knowing if this is what they would want for themselves is really heartbreaking. A lot of people ask me or ask any nurse in general, I think ICU specifically, like what is the hardest part of your job? Is it watching people die? And it's like, no watching people die is not the hardest part of my job unfortunately the hardest part of my job is doing unnecessary procedures to people who can't speak for themselves putting them through painful procedures keeping them alive longer than they should just because their family wants them alive um and that sounds horrible because if you don't work in my field because you don't understand just like i didn't when i was in nursing school or just a person who was a layman and doesn't do this stuff or see this stuff every day so you that might sound like a horrible thing for me to say like oh my god you're a nurse how could you say that somebody you know dying is not the worst thing but keeping them alive is it's because of if you couldn't speak for yourself if you couldn't tell me you were in pain if you couldn't wipe your own butt if you couldn't feed yourself how would you feel like if i turned you every two hours and you're just staring off into space is that a quality of life like is that fair is that a life i don't know it depends it's up to you to decide that and that's why i talk about that more further in advanced directives but that's what makes it hard when you see somebody that's clearly in pain on a ventilator or just visibly suffering and you're keeping them alive kind of just to keep them alive and you know they're never going to get better that is the hardest part of my job of course i want to see everybody um get better of course i want everybody to recover but there are just some people that you know the longer you become an icu nurse that are just not going to recover you you can tell based off things that you're seeing and families fight so hard and they don't want to let go and i totally understand i had to withdraw care from my grandpa a few years ago and it was the hardest thing I ever had to do but I knew his wishes I knew that he did not want to live a certain lifestyle and I had to respect that and even though he was my best friend and the love of my life I had to respect his wishes and unfortunately not everybody takes that into consideration and has an advanced directive so when it end of life happens to spring up on you out of nowhere you're like what do I do? You obviously don't want to make decisions for this person without knowing their wishes. So I feel a lot of times people actually keep their family members alive because they have hope or they have faith that they're going to get better. And then when they don't get better, I read a lot of research studies um, into this because I've done a few projects throughout my like bachelor's degree and master's degree about um, palliative care, comfort care, and hospice. And families actually a lot of the time regret not doing hospice or comfort care sooner because it's not till later on when they realize that they didn't get the outcome that they wanted for their family member that they did put them through all this um unnecessary procedures and tests and and stuff um so it's a sad realization and that's why i want to talk about it more because i want people to be aware that way if this ever does happen to you if you're ever forced to make these decisions you make the right ones for your family and don't ever feel like you're gonna regret it. So that leads me to comfort care. Comfort care is um, what we do in the hospital when we know there's a not a good outcome. Um, we know that there is uh, not really a chance of meaningful life, uh, meaning this person probably will never walk again, talk again, feed themselves again, or they simply just would not want to live this way and there's no like foreseeable good outcome or the patient is like very very old and they don't want to get intubated but their prognosis is not really good or they don't want chest compressions so some people actively say like i've had enough i'm done i rarely see those patients because i rarely if you're one of my patients in the intensive care unit you probably won't be able to talk for yourself um so i think in my five years as a nurse i've actually only had two people who couldn't speak or who could speak for themselves actually decide to go on comfort care only two in the five years um but basically what comfort care is is we order a morphine drip at least in the icu um because when i was on step down it was a little bit different um we didn't go and turn off all these machines it wasn't like that we just put them on a morphine drip but basically in the icu if you decide comfort care it doesn't matter um how old they are like if we clearly know that this is not um 
gonna be a good outcome or anything like that. Like we proceed with putting the patient on a morphine drip. We get a scopolamine patch and put them, not every hospital does this, but we put a scopolamine patch to help with uh, secretions and stuff. So we put it on the back of the, the ear or chest or wherever. We get atropine drops and put them in their mouth to kind of just decrease the secretions and the saliva. And we turn off all the machines so if they are on um, a ventilator, we take the ventilator off. Of course, we make sure they're comfortable. We titrate up the morphine um, so that they're not in any pain. And we turn off all the life-saving medications. So whether they're on vasopressors to assist them with drugs, if they have a pacemaker, we turn it off. And we let the patient die naturally um, on their own with dignity. And I know that sounds maybe shocking to some people if you're not in the medical field but it is i prefer that over and the reason why i chose comfort care for my grandpa specifically was because i knew he didn't want to live like this i knew his outcome wasn't good um and i just knew that this was not a life that he would want to live and i preferred to put him on comfort care and be there with him and hold his hand as he passed than to just keep pushing the limits on the ventilator knowing because you usually have two weeks to decide whether you're going to withdraw someone if um that you we can't get them off the vent you proceed with the trach after two weeks so i knew that my grandpa wasn't going to recover and i knew his outcome wasn't going to be good and i was more afraid for him to die alone in the hospital and a nurse call me at three o'clock in the morning tell me that he passed than to decide to withdraw care all of us be there holding his hand and being there while he passed so um, that also actually brings up brain death. Um, in California, at least, if you are legally declared brain death, legally within 24 hours, you have to be withdrawn from all life-sustaining um, interventions. It is not a decision that you can make with your family, like, oh, we'll put a trach, we'll put a peg and take them to a long-term care facility, like you could if somebody was in a persistent vegetative state. It doesn't work like that, um, unfortunately, and I think that is the hardest thing for patients to under, or patients' families to understand, because when people are legally declared brain dead, they can still have a heartbeat, they can still be uh, breathing on the ventilator so it's kind of a little tricky for the family to understand like what do you mean he's dead I'm clearly looking at him and he's breathing and he's got a pulse like this doesn't make any sense so it's really hard to understand but basically there's no brain function there's no brain reflexes like they are legally clinically uh, in fact deceased so I feel like that is something that is hard for patients to understand and especially when they're not gonna get the choice of let's continue interventions or let's um, trick pig and send them to a long-term care facility. That is not an option when you're brain deaf. So that is, I think, something I should definitely mention since we're kind of in the realm of um, the palliative and the hospice and the comfort care. But anyway, those are the decisions. Um, I mean, what the definitions are for each. I hope none of you ever have to um, decide upon one of these but I just want you to have a better understanding of what each is so let's reiterate um, palliative is for any chronic condition that you may have focuses on symptom management and pain control you want to live the most optimal life that you have with the chronic illness that you have um, hospice is when you have six months definitive to live and they focus on pain management and taking you home and making sure you're comfortable Brain death is when you are clinically deceased, your brain, you have no reflexes, you are not functioning, so they clin uh, withdraw care within 24 hours. And then comfort care is when the family decides that um, enough is enough, we're not going to proceed with any more um, interventions, and we are going to let this person die with dignity, and they turn everything off, put them on a morphine drip, and let them die peacefully while the family sits at bedside. So anyway, I hope this was informative for you guys. Um, I will link down the Advanced Directive video down below. See you next time. Bye!